Oh, I'm sharing that actual, <coughs> wait a second. Sorry. All right, I guess we'll get started because it seems like there's a lot of people here. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Dion Claiborne, not Rebecca. They have me log in under this. Uh, and Matthew, how do you say your last name? Rod. Rod? Yep. Okay, perfect. I'd like to introduce Matthew Rod, uh, Community Engagement and Partnership Coordinator from the VA uh, in Ann Arbor. And he graduated with his master's in social work in 2010 from the University of Michigan. He's been working in the field since. Matthew has experience in several areas related to mental health, including practice as a substance use disorder therapist, mobile crisis clinician, assertive community treatment team leader, suicide prevention case manager. Matthew has always seen the value in community partnerships while working on an individual level with patients and now uses his clinical experience to help guide his community engagement work. And Jeremy Suttles, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I, that didn't copy and paste correctly. Uh, one second. Uh, sorry about that. Jeremy uh, works as a community engagement partnership coordinator at the VA Ann Arbor Healthcare System. He completed his bachelor's degree in English at the University of Iowa, master's degree in education at the University of Kansas, and a master's in social work at the University of Michigan. He's worked both as an educator and a mental health clinician, and his clinical experiences and interests include crisis intervention, suicide risk assessment, addiction, recovery care, outpatient mental health, emergency psychiatry services, acute inpatient psychiatric care, group therapy, trainee education, community education and training, and the treatment of adults and adolescents. He currently serves as part of the Department of Veterans Affairs Community-Based Interventions for Suicide Prevention Program. And this is the VA's public health approach to suicide prevention, combining clinical care with community partnerships and to enhance suicide prevention and care. And just quickly, um, <clears throat> a housekeeping note um, that you'll keep your, um, your microphones off and um, cameras and microphones off unless you're speaking or sharing. Make sure you're clearly identifiable in Zoom or identifiable as the person you're masquerading, in my case. <laughs> uh, if needed, you can click the three dots to rename, your, uh, rename yourself to update your identity. And this is important for attendance records because some people are requesting some certification hours. Um, the CEU's attendance in this session is, is in full in submission of a complete Continuing Education Credits Gazunite uh, Credits Capture Form at the end of the session. And the link will be shared in the chat um, when five, five minutes are remaining. Uh, this is being recorded uh, and it's the property of Drug Free Jackson. I hope it's being recorded. I was trying to record it. Uh, I don't see the little... Yeah, it, it does say recording at the at the top of my screen, and we got the notice before, so I think we should still be okay. good. Okay, okay, good. Um, and then we understand this is long days, so be sure to focus on your wellness and self care throughout these presentations. And with that, I turn it over to Matthew and Jeremy. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I'm going to go ahead and see if I can share. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. You're not Rebecca. Yeah. Not. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. <laughs> Got me. All right. Um, I think you, um, it's, it's uh, host, I think, has to enable screen sharing. Oh, okay. Just a second. Uh, advanced. Let's no. see. Nope. All right. Let me see how I do that. Stop share. 
can I just name you the host? Is that what I can do? Yeah. Or yeah, that might work. Make a host. Jeremy, um, I'll make you a host too, just in case. Sounds good. You're a host now, uh, Matthew. You should be able to Perfect. start. Perfect. Okay, is it full screen on your screen? Good. Great, all right. Um, thanks again for the warm welcome. Uh, for those who were with us in our last presentation, kudos to you for coming back for some more. Um, we're gonna talk about lethal mean safety and uh, overdose prevention. And this is um, a topic that we care very deeply about. So before I get started, um, I'm just gonna ask real quickly, um, if in the chat, um, folks can just put in a number one or a number two. Number one, meaning um, you have heard this term before and are familiar with the term lethal means safety. And number two being maybe not so much. Um, uh, so let me just see kind of where people are at. <clears throat> Right, one, you got a few, couple ones in there, some twos. All right, that's good to know. I appreciate that. Um, you know, this was, uh, this is terminology that the VA uses quite a bit. And um, you may already be familiar with it possibly uh, in another way, but lethal means safety, uh, we'll get into it. So before, uh, official introduction here to what that is. Uh, we're going to talk about sort of the intersection of substance use and suicide. Um, we'll talk uh, briefly about why veterans are particularly at higher risk for suicide, um, how limiting access to lethal means during periods of crises uh, to make it more likely that the person will survive, and discussing and advocating for effective methods of medication-based storage and disposal and best practices for safety planning. So what is lethal means and what is lethal means safety? Well, to start, lethal means is anything, basically, such as firearms or medications that can be used to inflict uh, self-directed violence. And lethal means safety is an intentional voluntary practice to reduce one's suicide risk by limiting access to those lethal means. Um, limiting access to lethal means during uh, times of crisis can make it more likely that the person will either delay or survive a suicide attempt. So um, perhaps you may be wondering um, if an approach to removing access to, to lethal means, you know, does it really work? You know, if we take away um, one method of, of some potential uh, way that somebody could um, attempt suicide with, what's the natural question that follows? I'm, I'm gonna throw it out there to the group and ask to respond either in chat or um, unmute and <clears throat> kind of state the obvious question. So if we take away one thing, then what, what do you feel is uh, the, the next statement you could say? Perhaps I did not maybe word that <laughs> the most effective way. All right, so I'll, I'll just kind of throw it out there. Um, the question we get asked a lot is, you know, if you take away one method of someone uh, who's thinking about uh, attempting suicide or having suicidal thoughts, take one method away, what's to stop them from just finding another method? Um, and does, you know, lethal means safety really work? Because that's kind of what we're talking about when we talk about lethal means safety. And that's a good question. I mean, it's a natural question to kind of think about. Um, and so the good news is there's been some studies um, that have been done on this. And, and that is good news because 
Um, studies related to this are very difficult often um, in the literature to find because of obvious reasons with ethics and um, you know, uh, the methodology of how they conduct this research. But um, the, obvi the, the, the research shows that, uh, when individ that individuals rarely deviate from that initial suicide plan. Um, so um, in studies related to firearm availability and access, um, you, have, you will see there at the top that Australia had a 4.7% decline in suicide rates each year since legislation. Uh, Israeli Defense Forces, once they implemented a suicide prevention plan, which included um, limited access to firearms during non-essential training, they experienced a 40% reduction in their suicide rates. Um, and then legislation in Indiana and Connecticut um, for risk-based seizure laws um, showed a 13% decline in suicide rates after legislative changes. What is a risk-based seizure law? It would be similar to if somebody owned firearms or something of that nature, um, and let's say they had an inpatient hospitalization after uh, a suicide attempt perhaps, um, that for a period of time, they wouldn't have access to their firearms. So this is legislation that's happened in a few states and they saw a 13% decrease in suicide rates, which is a huge number in suicide prevention. Another example um, comes from the UK. And in the UK, um, not too long ago, they had a lot of um, coal gas that was feeding through their pipes that powered uh, folks' stoves and it was part of their infrastructure. The number one method in the UK uh, for death by suicide was um, inhaling that coal gas from within the stove. And as we know, pretty much everybody has a stove in their house. So the access was immediate and it was available. Um, whether it be for infrastructure changes or upgrades or updates, what happened was um, they ended up changing everything over to natural gas. And when that happened, the suicide, suicide rates dropped 43% um, because car, you know, natural gas has a very, very low um, carbon monoxide uh, portion to it compared to coal gas. So that option wasn't there. And so what they found was um, not only did suicide rates drop, but they stayed that way. And that is a very important thing to, to note because it, it, for the majority of people, they didn't go on to find other methods. When that immediate access was no longer there, it served as a huge protective factor um, to promote a good outcome if somebody was in a suicidal crisis. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the takeaway from this is suicide is preventable. Um, by removing immediate access to lethal means. Um, the research supports it, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as we kind of go on. Um, so the pattern that suicide rates drop when access to lethal means is unavailable, it's been replicated, um, and people rarely switch to different methods. Now, when we talk about this in the community engagement work that we do, uh, this can be a very challenging conversation for pretty obvious reasons, especially when it comes to uh, firearm discussion. So it can be difficult conversations uh, with communities at times, you know, it gets wrapped up into uh, gun rights and things like that. Um, but the point of lethal means safety is not, and I repeat, is not to take away a person's rights um, or their firearms. Um, there's just effect the evidence just supports that creating the time and distance between a person and their means while they're in a crisis is just a very effective strategy at reducing suicide. Um, so firearm studies, you know, in places where folks had immediate access um, to firearms being restricted also demonstrates the same results um, and decreased suicide risk. So um, it is kind of about, to put it simply, it's uh, anti-suicide, not anti-firearm when we're talking about firearms in particular. All right, so um, as we kind of talk about this subject, we're also going to discuss the intersection between um, substance use and suicide and how that pertains to lethal means safety as well. Um, so why does this uh, subject matter in the substance abuse prevention arena? How does this apply? 
Um, well, first and foremost, um, individuals attempt suicide by overdosing on medications. And many of these attempts are either not reported uh, or documented as intentional. And because of this, many individuals are not receiving adequate and necessary mental health and substance abuse treatment following an overdose. Um, the likelihood uh, that somebody using substances um, you know, has a reduced judgment and may is more likely to attempt suicide is there, and especially with firearms. Um, and so having more people trained in suicide prevention and also more people trained with lethal mean safety and what that means will definitely increase um, the opportunity that an individual not only gets linked to the treatment that they need, but also um, decreases the likelihood of a lethal suicide attempt. Um, so lethal mean safety definitely plays uh, a very, very important role. And, um, and I believe tends to be sometimes overlooked, um, especially in the safety planning arena. Um, you know, when practitioners or clinicians are working with folks in safety planning, uh, this is something that can sometimes be breezed over. Um, so we definitely want to make sure that we put an emphasis on this. So I'm really happy to see everybody here that's attended. So um, within the veteran population in the Veteran Health Administration, patients with mental health or substance use disorders, um, there was a study done, which was pretty much the largest ever examination of substance use disorders and suicide. It involved over 4.4 uh, 4 million veterans as part of this study. Um, in all, uh, the suicide rate was about 75.6 per 100,000 for veterans with any substance use disorder compared to 34.7 per 100,000 for veterans overall. Um, roughly, uh, we're in Michigan here and roughly, uh, I think the suicide rate on average per 100,000 is, is right around 14. This number is always kind of changing a bit. So as you can tell, uh, veterans are just at a higher risk in general, but veterans also now with co-occurring substance use disorder in mental health um, is at an even greater risk. Um, in 2017, about roughly 68% of drug overdoses were with prescription opioids. And um, to no surprise, opioids are the most common drugs found in suicide by overdose. Um, so the rate of opioid use disorder um, amongst patients in the Veterans Health Administration is about seven times higher than that of um, non-VHA enrollees. So, um, so definitely there's an interest here of how to make a difference in this area. Uh, the 2020 National Veteran Suicide Prevention Annual Report that comes out every year um, shows that veterans, uh, VHA users were diagnosed with um, substance use disorders that were diagnosed with substance use disorders had higher rates of suicide than those with depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. And that can also be maybe an interesting fact because um, there seems to be the natural connection there between um, folks thinking about veterans receiving care and post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but it's important to note that um, substance use disorders um, remain some of the highest risk factors as far as um, suicide deaths go in the VHA healthcare system. So here we have um, a graph that some may be familiar with, and I believe we even showed this at our last presentation, um, if you were at that presentation, but we're looking at um, the drug overdose, overdose deaths um, kind of going up in the huge peak that happened um, during the pandemic. So while in, uh, in the Veterans Health Administration and VHA healthcare, um, we actually saw a decline in suicide deaths. Um, you know, we have to be careful not to be overly uh, rejoiceful, um, and it is a great thing. We want to see the decline, but we've also noticed this huge influx, uh, which has affected the nation, not just veterans, um, of overdose deaths. So we definitely have a lot of work to still do. Um, so more than 100,000 uh, people died of drug overdose in the United States during the 12-month period ending in April 2021. That's a new record high. Um, you know, over, overdose deaths jumped roughly 28% from the same period a year earlier and nearly doubled, uh, doubled over in the past five years. Um, so we're kind of seeing not just, you know, we're just seeing the effects now of, um, of what this looks like here, especially coming out of uh, the pandemic. 
Um, hopefully we can kind of see some better data as it comes out, but this is sort of the most recent information that we have. Um, you know, perhaps could have even been predicted, uh, who knows, but um, nonetheless, this is where it's at. Um, overdose, overdose deaths from um, methamphetamine and also other psychostimulants um, also increased significantly um, up 48% in the last year and in April 2021 compared to the year before. So it, um, it accounted for more than a quarter of all the overdose deaths in the last 12 month period. Um, so not only are we dealing with um, the issues with opioids and also as it relates to fentanyl, uh, but now psychos, um, you know, other stimulants are also on the rise. So overall, this is, um, of course, very concerning. So we know, um, you know, unquestionably, it, it's just a challenging thing for a lot of these deaths to be ruled as a suicide. Um, but nonetheless, it, this all remains, um, you know, not just a veteran issue, of course, this is a national issue, uh, affects the general population along with the veteran population. Um, so societal factors, economic disparities, race, um, ethnicity, LGBTQ disparities, homelessness, social connection and isolation, health and well-being, uh, these all play additional roles in suicide, of course, some of these factors increasing the risk. Um, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, don't have to, it goes without saying this has placed a, a very big additional strain on our nation and on individuals and communities. And um, we know that one suicide is too many. If anyone here has lost anybody to suicide, you know how devastating that can be. Um, and, you know, it roughly impacts about 135 people, 135 survivors that are left. So um, this is a, a problem that is preventable and one that we believe to be everybody's business. Um, so this isn't something for just a therapist to figure out or a psychologist to figure out. This is really something that it takes a community to figure out. It takes not just organizations, but individuals. So the more people that are kind of familiar with this information, uh, the better equipped we will be as a, as a society and as a community to help folks um, that are in trouble. So um, just some information here on, um, you know, some uh, suicide rates comparing uh, in the blue, the veteran population um, compared to the adults, um, non-veteran uh, U.S. adult population. And as I mentioned before, uh, this just sort of illustrates um, that we have a, a higher risk group within the veteran population. And, um, you know, just like any other subgroup that's at higher risk, you know, we have to pay special attention to the unique needs of those groups and do what we can um, to help support them. So what are some of the risk factors? Um, gender, um, and typically um, more men die by suicide than women. Um, age, um, generally it's an older population, but this also varies from, um, you know, from older adults generally being at higher risk, older adult males. Um, you know, this, this definitely varies from uh, group to group. Lack of social support is another risk factor, um, lacking a sense of connection, lacking a sense of um, you know, community. This plays an important risk factor as far as that goes. And just to back up a quick second, uh, when we talk about risk factors, you know, what we're really saying is these are the things that could increase the risk that somebody may um, you know, attempt suicide. These are not guarantees. But these are definitely things that if we're thinking about in the back of our mind, we want to pay special attention to, um, as these could potentially lead to that or increases the risk of that. Um, moving forward, current or um, any kind of history of psychiatric diagnosis, um, somebody's experiencing command auditory hallucinations to kill oneself would be considered a risk factor. And just a kind of special note on that, um, you know, some of the mental illnesses that we hear about the most, such as schizophrenia, um, are generally not the most prevalent. Um, so just to kind of mention, you know, the prevalence of schizophrenia in the adult U.S. population is roughly about 1%. Um, so command hallucinations generally are associated with uh, schizophrenia, um, also bipolar disorder, um, and those folks are definitely at a higher risk of suicide. But I just want to kind of note that even though that's uh, listed there, it isn't the most common uh, presentation you might see. Uh, but nonetheless, that is, a, that is a concerning risk factor. Substance abuse, of course, is a, is a risk factor. Um, 
one of the biggest uh, predictors of future behavior is the past history of a suicide attempt. Um, so that's something to think about. Family history of suicide increases the risk that somebody will attempt suicide in their lifetime. Uh, legal issues um, play a role just as any other psychosocial um, uh, challenge that somebody may be going through, including job, job loss, financial stress, uh, loss of relationships, significant life events, um, you know, loss of freedom. Um, there's lots of different, issues, you know, different socioeconomic uh, issues that can come up as a risk factor. Um, just any kind of history of um, impulsive behavior um, or high risk behavior, uh, behavior that anybody would just kind of deem as um, potentially life threatening, um, engaging in uh, really risky behavior. So driving at a really high speed, you know, kind of not caring what happens, you know, these are some examples of um, something that would be, um, you know, high risk behavior. Having immediate access to firearms or lethal means, um, of course, is another risk factor, as we've already mentioned. And just overall, any feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, um, these are all sort of the risk factors. Um, not an inclusive list, by the way. Um, so it's also very individual, too. So we never want to kind of look at somebody's um, definition of what's, you know, what's impactful to them um, in a negative way. We, it's real to them, no matter what they're experiencing. And we want to definitely be very attuned to what they're going through and very empathetic. Um, protective factors on the flip side, um, these are pretty much your opposite to risk factors. One of the number one protective factors is connection. Um, connection to another person, connection to uh, a higher power, connection to a community group. Um, sometimes it's, you know, I could never do anything to hurt myself because my dog's the only, the only thing I got and, you know, they rely on me put food in the bowl every day. I could just never do that despite my struggle. You know, so protective factors, again, can look very unique to each person. Um, it just depends on what they are. But um, generally speaking, a good social support network, um, having purpose in life, uh, meaning, uh, meaningful caregiving, uh, which, you know, caregiving in itself also can then become even a risk factor to pay what we're talking about, just um, some of the burden that that carries with it. Other times it can be a protective factor. Um, cultural and religious beliefs uh, that prohibit suicide can be uh, protective factors, uh, problem, good problem solving skills, um, engagement in mental health or uh, even physical health, um, physical health care, um, no prior suicide attempts, you know, not, not using drugs or alcohol, um, being engaged in meaningful work or just having that sense of purpose and uh, willing to work with <clears throat> staff or family on safety planning. So. Um, just as risk factors, just shooting back here real quick, just as risk factors are not guarantees that somebody will attempt suicide, the same goes for uh, the protective factors. Protective factors are also not guarantees that somebody won't act on the thought of suicide. Um, one that often gets muddied up in the discussion is future orientation. Uh, maybe a, a term that you've heard before. Well, they're future oriented. Uh, <clears throat> you know, they got you know, they got the graduation party uh, next week with his kids, you know, he's looking forward to that. I'm just saying he, but, you know, he's looking forward to that. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure that that's, that's, this isn't an issue. You know, they've got things they're looking forward to. You got to be careful of that um, because that would also kind of serve as a protective factor, but it's not a guarantee. Uh, in fact, there's, you know, could be plans that once he attends that graduation party, then that may be the time where they plan on taking their life. Maybe that's the last event that they want to attend um, out of obligation or whatever it may be. So you never know, uh, but of course you definitely want to explore those. So warning signs <clears throat> moves into sort of a different territory. Um, the risk factors uh, would sort of be equated to, let's say if we're talking about heart health, um, I like to kind of talk about that in terms uh, we can all understand, you know, risk factors of heart health could be, you know, little to no exercise, unhealthy diet, uh, you know, drinking too much, not sleeping enough, you know, who knows what that could look like, but you get the picture. Those are all things that increase the risk of heart problems, let's say. Um, the warning signs of heart problems would just be those immediate signs that we need to get some help. And the immediate signs for a heart-related condition, of course, maybe you get some numbness shooting down our left arm, chest pains. Uh, we've got 
you know, other things happening in the immediate physical realm of our bodies. Um, think of the same thing as far as this goes. Uh, so suicide warning signs are things we uh, would want to look at and say this needs immediate attention. And some of those things include uh, an overt expression that somebody is having thoughts of suicide, thoughts of wanting to die, wanting to kill themselves, um, expressions of uh, hopelessness, helplessness, feeling of uh, nothing will get better, maybe feeling trapped, um, feeling as though they were a burden to others is another one that's very common. Um, mm -hmm. looking for ways to kill themselves, um, you know, researching methods, obtaining methods, uh, perhaps stockpiling medications. These are uh, things that you definitely want to pay attention to. Um, increased use of drugs or alcohol is also on here. Um, so if it's uh, somebody who use, used to maybe um, indulge on the weekend is now um, using maybe more often all through the week, uh, missing work, uh, missing other obligations. So those are things you'd want to look out for. Um, acting anxious or agitated or behaving recklessly. Um, that's a little tougher to kind of to, to kind of identify unless you're very familiar with somebody. Um, but you'd want to kind of explore that if, you know, especially combined with some other warning signs, that person could very well be struggling with the thought of whether or not uh, they should act on this, um, act on their suicidal impulse. Um, the other thing to say about that is if um, somebody who is genuinely baseline, um, very anxious or even depressed, and then suddenly like a light switch um, seems to be at complete peace and seems to be very relaxed and their whole demeanor changes. That is also a very immediate warning sign you'd wanna look out for because that perhaps could be the fact that that person has made the decision now to kill themselves and is now at peace with that choice. So that is something also to think about. Uh, some additional warning signs, um, withdrawing or feeling isolated. So withdrawing from others, withdrawing from their common uh, social engagements or social events or socializing that they generally do. Um, increased rage or talking about maybe seeking revenge on somebody, um, extreme mood swings. And then lastly, giving away personal belongings. Um, the last one just being, um, you know, that someone has again made that decision and uh, now they're trying to get their affairs in order. So maybe they're calling insurance companies to see if their family will get paid. They're giving away belongings to folks um, or maybe they're making lots of calls to family that they ordinarily wouldn't do uh, as if they're saying goodbyes. So those are some things to look for. And you know, we have a pretty good audience of people here. Um, I just want to kind of ask the question and put it out there. I mean, these are this is a pretty, pretty decent list, but none of this is all encompassing. I'm just curious if anybody here um, can think of any other immediate warning signs that somebody could be potentially in a suicidal crisis. Thanks, Rebecca. Increased energy. Uh, yes, especially after depression, that's a very good point. Any other thoughts? You could put them in the chat or you could say them out loud. Yeah, and feel free, anybody, to chime in anytime with any questions or anything as we kind of go through these. But yeah, if you do have some, uh, put them out there. It's always good to share because sometimes, you know, we look at these and they may or may not be obvious, but um, the better, the more familiar we are with what to look for, um, I mean, definitely share that information. It's definitely good to know what some of these things look like. Matthew, um, Matthew, yep. to follow up on that, I just wanted to clarify that that's what I've heard that. And I saw I'm asking if this is true, that people who have been in a depression, like because during the depression, they're basically immobilized, that they're not at as high a risk of suicide as when they start to come out of the depression, 
because then they have a little more energy and now they can actualize um, their plan. Yeah, and I've heard the same too. Um, <clears throat> you know, somebody who's really, really suffered from some long-term debilitating depression at times will have relief. They'll get some energy back or maybe they've started a new medication that they're starting to feel a little bit better. It's also a time which seems ironic. Um, while, you know, why would somebody do that if they're just starting to feel better? They've been depressed for so long. Well, you know, the fear is usually that, you know, this isn't going to last and there's no hope there. Uh, it's just going to return back to this. And I don't want to get back to that. It's sometimes some of the thinking, and I have heard the same thing. So, um, yeah, definitely as a provider, um, you know, we could be very relieved that somebody is feeling better and that's great, but it's really important to always, you know, check in. And that's why, um, you know, assessing for the risk of suicide, it can be, uh, should be an ongoing thing, especially if someone has presented with some of this to really continue to check in with the person to see how they're doing, even if they're reporting, they're feeling better because sometimes that acute risk may seem like it's disappearing, uh, but you never know until you ask. And most people will be pretty upfront with you. So that's a great point. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. I'm seeing if there's anything else here. Um, Yeah, stopping medications without physician assistance could be another sign, sure. Okay, so this um, next slide here, um, you know, the this kind of illustrates the time between when a person decides to die by suicide and the time in which they act on that decision. Um, and it is very, uh, a very short period of time. Um, so going back to sort of this, um, the beginning of this presentation when we talked about, you know, can lethal means safety really be effective? You know, um, you know, if that immediate access really isn't there, is that really going to stop them from acting out on that thought? Well, when a uh, study from 2005 shows that um, from thought to action occurs in less than five minutes for about 25% of attempters, uh, less than and for less than 20 minutes, about 48%, and with an hour, 71%. So this is really, really important information that really also supports some of the studies we talked about at the beginning. When the immediate access is not there, um, it goes a huge way to promoting a good outcome that somebody is going to survive. Um, without saying, um, you know, methods, uh, the method of which somebody is using to attempt suicide is, is very important as well, especially when it comes to firearms, because um, 85 to 90% of suicide attempts by firearms are lethal um, compared to, as you can see on the bottom right, all other methods combined ends up being 5% fatal. Uh, so, there are, uh, so that is a huge thing to kind of look at. So firearms, we kind of talk about specifically, of course, because uh, naturally, um, it is a very important one to put some attention to. Um, so uh, this is uh, important because it really does illustrate the importance of lethal means safety. So imagine, imagine if these folks here who 71%, um, you know, attempted within an hour, if they didn't have that immediate access there available, the key is time and distance. And if we have enough time and enough distance that acute crisis um, can, uh, you know, generally passes and, and people don't act on that thought. So uh, lethal means safety plays that much more of an important role in keeping somebody safe more than sometimes we ever believed, uh, which is an important thing to know. Um, so however we build that time and space um, is, you know, however it's done, uh, as long as we do the best we can to kind of do that, uh, makes a huge difference. And as I mentioned before, people rarely substitute one means for another. So if that immediate um, plan is not available, um, most of the time people are not going to go and look for another method. Um, this has also been researched since um, the Golden Gate Bridge has uh, put up barriers for suicide, which finally recently happened. And there has been a lot of studies done on that since it's happened, which also still supports uh, what we're talking about today. Um, so 
um, no matter, um, you know, so basically means matter, the way in which people are thinking about taking their lives matters and putting the time and distance there um, definitely is huge. Um, Jeremy, is this where you're gonna jump in? Yeah, I'll go ahead and hop in here. Perfect, okay, turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you. Um, so just to kind of piggyback on some of the stuff that Matt already covered, but just to say that, you know, this is kind of a weird statement, but he, Matt and I were talking about this before this, and lethal means safety is something that's kind of exciting um, for us as, as suicide prevention specialists because we know it works. We know that this is one specific thing that we can do as family members, as providers, as community members to really reduce someone's risk of suicide and also decrease the number of suicides that happen. Um, I also want to return to the idea that a lot of what we're going to be talking about moving forward in the next slides are voluntary measures that people can take. We're not trying to command or demand or force people to do some of these things. These are strategies that can be helpful and that that process and that those conversations should be very collaborative and open and encourage the voluntary nature of things. And I also like to emphasize that it can be helpful to frame lethal means safety and lethal means safety interventions in the context of these interventions being temporary. I like to use the example of a cast for a broken leg you know, you're gonna wear the cast for as long as you need to. And once you no longer need it, then you can kind of return to normal. And lethal means safety can be the same thing. You know, we're not talking about changing things forever or having someone, you know, <clears throat> remove firearms from, from their lives. We're more talking about like, what can we do in the short term to increase someone's protective, you know, factors to decrease that access to some of those means. So echoing that on what Matt said, um, and we're going to start first by talking about overdose prevention and some of the things that we can do in that area. So as Matt mentioned earlier, opioid overdose deaths have been on the rise here in the United States, in part due to the increasing presence of fentanyl and other substances like it, in response to the elevated risk for both accidental and intentional opioid overdose, there's been an increased emphasis on providing education and access to overdose reversal medications such as naloxone. For those of you who may not be as familiar with naloxone, it's a medication that can rapidly reverse the effects of an opioid. It blocks the opioid receptors in the brain and can block the effects of the medication or drug. And it can be used to quickly restore things like normal breathing to someone who has slowed or stopped breathing. And while it is effective for opioid overdose, it's not effective for overdose of other medications. <clears throat> there are other, other interventions that need to take place, you know, sometimes medical, like going to the emergency room to have a stomach pumped or ingesting charcoal. There are things that can be done um, in those cases, but this naloxone medication is specifically for opioid overdose. It's also important to note that this is not a standard treatment for those that might have opioid use disorders because it's meant to be utilized on an emergent basis to help prevent death. It is usually indicated for patients with an identified history or current suicide risk who have access to opioids or for people who may be actively using prescription or non-prescription opioids. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is available in both a nasal spray and injection form. And it can often be found in pharmacies or provided by community agencies or law enforcement. More and more people are becoming trained on how to administer naloxone. That next slide. And these um, are some places, some possible access points to get either naloxone or training on how to administer it here in uh, the county. You know, veterans receiving care through the Ann Arbor VA or the Jackson VA clinic can also speak with their providers to get that education and information and access. And education and access to naloxone is encouraged as well for family members or providers who may come into contact with individuals at risk for opioid overdose. A lot of times we might know people in our lives who are on medications for pain, we might know people in our lives who are still struggling with substance use or addiction, or we may be in settings where we might come across someone who is possibly used a substance and might need that intervention. So encourage people to consider if you haven't already 
looking into this training or looking into access to, to naloxone specifically. Next slide. <clears throat> so now aside from opioids, we're going to talk about medications because medications are also a common lethal means for suicide. It's common for people to have supplies of medications, whether that's over the counter or past unused medications within their home, especially if a person has had prescription changes or maybe they've fallen out of care in the past. Maybe they were going to see their doctor who prescribed a bunch of medications and then they just stopped going, but they still have the medications on hand. And there are a number of options for disposing of unneeded or unwanted medications, including things like medication disposal kits, medication take back events. We just had one up in Genesee County um, this past weekend, um, sponsored by the Genesee County Prevention Coalition on the National DEA Take Back Day, um, as well as safe disposal of medications through deactivating them. It's always encouraged that if someone is interested in getting rid of unwanted medication, that they follow guidelines for safely disposing of those medications, rather than simply flushing them down the toilet or putting them in the trash. And in most cases, medications cannot be reused, um, you know, even in situations where someone might have a family member on the same medication, we would encourage getting rid of those unused or old medications for not only the safety factor, but also the efficacy of those medications and and the care of the other person. <clears throat> Next slide. There are also practices that providers and patients can take with regards to current or active prescriptions. For example, providers and patients may want to have discussions about refill frequency or amounts of medications dispensed. It can be useful to limit supplies of medications to maybe one to two weeks at a time so that a person has access to a smaller total dose of medication, meaning that if they were to have those impulsive thoughts and within that first hour, you know, they were considering taking action to end their life, they would have less access or access to a smaller dose that might not be lethal of those medications. Blister packing medication can also be a helpful tool as it helps a, an individual person keep track of the medications they've taken it can help their family members or caregivers keep tabs on how they've been taking their medications. And it can also provide some barrier to taking large amounts of medication in a short amount of time. I'm sure people have experience, you know, getting medications out of the little pack and sometimes it can be really frustrating and, and slow. Um, it can be a useful tool and just adding that extra time, putting that distance between someone and their means. Providers can also have conversations with patients about their current pattern of medication use. For example, are patients taking more of their medication than prescribed or are they missing doses and developing a stockpile of unused medications? If this, uh, a patient is not taking a medication, um, maybe they stop because of side effects. It's important for providers to ask and say, hey, if you're not taking that medication anymore, what are you doing with it? Would you like to get rid of it? Is something that we can talk about? Let's you know engage in some options and discussion. Next slide. Along with this, there are other ways that you can rid your home of unwanted medications, including um, providers like the VA or other pharmacies that can provide envelopes for returning unwanted medications. Um, usually they can be mailed. They often come with postage already paid on the envelopes. And they can also be dropped off at medication drop boxes, uh, of which there are usually locations throughout your county um, where you can look into disposing those safely and you know, anonymously as needed. Next slide. So I'm mean, now I'm going to go over a few different resources, and all these resources are going to be available online, but just to sort of highlight some actual practical tools that can be used for yourself. Um, for the clinics that you work in or in the communities. Um, this is an example of one resource on opioid overdose prevention, and it includes signs of a potential overdose, as well as you know, what to do if you think someone is overdosing. Again, calling back to the idea of things like naloxone as an intervention in these situations. Next slide. So this, I know, is going to be hard to read because <laughs> 
because it's a lot of text on a, a PowerPoint slide, but this is a VA resource on how to stay safe if someone is prescribed opioid medications. And it includes uh, guidelines such as having clear and open communication with providers about all current medications, as well as medication storage options. You know, we often look as providers for things like interactions with other medications. You know, if a person is on multiple opioids or maybe they're on an opiate and um, a benzodiazepine or other medications, there can be some significant interactions that place people are more at risk. But it's also important in situations where maybe someone has multiple providers. For us at the VA, we often see veterans who receive care from a VA provider, but they may also have a community provider. And it's important for those providers to communicate and to have all that information. And there are other things that we'll still talk about with um, medications, if you want to move to the next slide. Because as we mentioned before, given the rise of opioid overdose related deaths, more and more people are becoming familiar with overdose prevention and intervention. And so this is one resource available again from the VA. Um, for family members and supports of veterans who might be at risk for opioid overdose. And this tool, like the others, are available for download, for access, and available for you to use uh, reference as needed. Next slide. So the next two slides are actually going to be two sides of the same brochure, which is discussing various forms of lethal means safety. And some important takeaways are things that Matt has already actually touched on um, and that firearms are the most lethal method of suicide. And that's both in the general population and in uh, the veteran population. You know, for the general population here in Michigan, um, you know, a little over half of suicide deaths occur via firearm. And in the veteran population here in Michigan, we're looking at almost 70% of those deaths occur via firearm. You know, as, as Matt mentioned before too, most attempts occur within the first hour of ideation. So removing, restricting, or slowing access to lethal means such as firearms can help a person outlast that window of elevated risk and help save lives. And as well, as Matt said, when one method of suicide is removed or delayed, it's not likely that a person will substitute or switch methods. You know, if you're a provider in the community, people may say that to you like, I can, do use anything, you know, I, I've got tons of stuff here that I might use to, to end my life. Um, but the reality is, is that once a person has decided on a means to use to harm themselves, it's uncommon for them to switch to something else because they may not have access to all those methods at a certain time, or they may not have the availability to use that without people noticing, or they might have specific fears of pain or suffering with certain methods. Next slide. Um, so this is the other side of the brochure, and there are some specific tools and resources available for firearm safety and firearm storage, including safes and off-site storage. Some people may choose to give their firearm or ammunition to someone else to store or to store their firearm at a gun range or with a dealer who provides storage. And while these options are actually beneficial um, and removing a firearm from the home is one of the best ways to prevent suicide, there are, of course, other factors to consider, such as firearms that may not be owned legally or may not be registered, um, the comfort level of family members or neighbors with storing someone's firearm, or whether or not other people are actually legally allowed to have access to firearms. So when discussing firearm access and safety, it's important to assess for some of those factors, but also um, ask specific details about the type and number of firearms a person has accessible to them, as well as how is the, the firearm commonly stored? Is it kept locked? Is it unlocked? Is it kept loaded or unloaded? Who else has access to this? Um, because tools such as gun locks can also be helpful and the VA and several other agencies such as police stations or community agencies can provide those for free to interested individuals. Next slide. So this is an example uh, from a, a billboard that's sponsored by Project Child Safe, which is a program from the National Shooting Sports Foundation. Project Child Safe has a number of great resources and toolkits, as well as educational guidance for providers, law enforcement, educators, and families. 
There are also age appropriate tools for children, including educational videos that can be viewed and shared. Next slide. So this is an example of one type of gun lock available. This is a cable lock, and this is the type of gun lock provided by the VA if people are interested. No lock is perfect or foolproof, and there are other steps that can be taken to make any gun lock or any firearm storage option more effective. And in the case of a cable lock, you know, giving the key to someone else, um, also disabling the firearm by removing the firing pin or you know, storing ammunition elsewhere, um, including removing the firearm completely from the home. And using something like a gun lock may bypass some of the concerns that people might bring up about someone's comfort or the legality of storing a firearm elsewhere, but it also can help reduce the risk to others in the home of the firearm being used intentionally or accidentally. Next slide. So this is a free toolkit available again through the VA. It's actually a partnership resource created by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the VA and the National Shooting Sports Foundation. It's actually a phenomenal resource. I would highly, highly recommend this, even just if you want to download it and peruse it and email it to your colleagues or share it with patients, people in the community. It includes options for safe storage, situations in which firearm storage and access changes might be appropriate as well as ways to collaborate with community members and agencies to enhance firearm safety. Next slide. There are many options available for firearm storage and lethal means protection, including things like the gun locks or removing ammunition, gun safes, and giving the firearms to someone else. But identifying the right option for safe storage or, or lethal means restriction should be handled on an individual level and take into account the values, experience, desires and treatment needs of that person. You know, this is a very, for some people, difficult conversation to have because you don't necessarily want to be telling someone what to do or make them um, feel resistant to having those conversations. So if you take time to understand why do people have firearms? What do they use them for? What's their history? Or they have medications at home. Do they have medications for themselves and other people? When we're talking about safe storage and other options, we really want to engage them in a broad conversation on a voluntary basis. Next slide. So these are just some more examples of storage options that are available. Um, and before I go on just to the next resource section, I just want to ask Dion, how much time do we have? Do we stop at 1.35 or do we, do we go a little bit longer than that? Dean, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Uh, does anyone have any questions? We still have a couple of minutes left. Do we go to 135? Uh, we get like, according to me, we got two, three minutes left. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, people have questions. Feel free to ask now. Um, post them in the chat. I'm sorry, you know, we may not have time for a lot of discussion. These are some resources that Matt can cycle through. These will be in the slides that are shared with you. And things like various trainings that are available for you, um, individuals or community members, um, different resources and toolkits that are available online um, for lethal means safety and suicide prevention, how to make your firearms more safe at home for yourself and your families. Um, the 24-hour Veterans Crisis Line and National Crisis Line available for call, text, or with a Veterans Life Crisis Line, you can also have an anonymous chat online. Um, Project Child Safe, which I mentioned, highly recommend. Some additional resources on lethal means, including the, the training, the free online training on counseling to access to lethal means. It's a, about a one to two hour voluntary free online training that I would encourage people to take and a community provider toolkit similar to the safe firearm storage toolkit but this one focuses on education on military cultural competency some more information on research to practice and local resources including local coalitions um, the lifeway cmh with their 24 access to crisis services and henry ford allegiance to emergency care 
community coalitions that are already doing some of this work and maybe addressing some of these issues, whether it's you know Drug Free Jackson or um, the local county suicide prevention coalition or the Michigan Governor's Challenge. And then some more professional resources and our risk consultation program, if you're ever interested or need help and guidance in suicide prevention for your agency, feel free to reach out to our risk consultation program and we're happy to help. Yeah, so any other questions, feel free. Uh, Matt, if you wanna advance all the way to our contact information, the slides that you'll have um, will include um, us, so you can reach out to us at any time and really appreciate all the, the interest and in for you showing up to, to engage in like a really important conversation on how we can save lives. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy and Matt. Um, and uh, don't forget if you need CEUs, the link is in the chat. I'm gonna put it one more time. Um, and you need to fill that out to get CEUs. Last opportunity for questions. Well, don't forget there's one more session left. If anybody wants to go to another session. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, everybody.